here at Engine Labs, and I would like to welcome you to the 25th anniversary celebration of Jurassic Park! Tonight is going to be a lot of fun. 25 years! Talk about a blast from the past. And I don't mean dinosaur flatulence. I'm a scientist, not a comedian. Okay. Well, we've got a lot to see and do tonight. Uh, we have our partners here tonight. Uh, they are here showcasing all kinds of really great toys and games inspired by the franchise. If you go down the line of Jurassic Park, you will see uh, Oculus is here with their VR experience. Mattel is here with some toys. Uh, we've got some mobile games by Ludia, pinball games by Zen Studios. All kinds of really great stuff down there, so please go and see that. 
Uh, we also have some great photo opportunities for you. Uh, the Jeep is down there, the gyrosphere from Jurassic World. Uh, we also have our live specimen, they will be out uh, momentarily. We have um, Zulu and Bravo here with us tonight. We also have some special guests that will be uh, hopefully walking around and introducing themselves. I would like to make a formal introduction right here on stage. So first up, I would like to introduce Dr. Wu. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. My name is Dr. Henry Wu. I am the chief geneticist here at InGen. First off, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. It means so much to see all of you guys here. And I'm so thrilled to be able to show you guys what we are uh, what we are doing here and uh, what we have prepared to show you guys. Back next to the Jurassic Partners, we have an amazing gallery display full of fossils and a lot of artifacts. So make sure you come check us out. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Thank you so much. Uh, next up... Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Ian Malcolm. Thank you, thank you. I, I think uh, definitely the uh, model for tonight's festivities should be life finds a way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ian Malcolm. Uh, next up, I would like to introduce Mr. Dennis Nedry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nedry. And last but not least, our founder, Dr. John Hammond! As you can see, with all we have going on here tonight, we've spared no expense! <laughs> Carry on, Mr. MC. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Oh my God. Now, if you would like uh, to own your very own copy of the original Jurassic Park, we have it in our retail space. But also, we have the 25th anniversary edition uh, Blu-ray 4K. That'll be out on May 22nd, so keep a lookout for that. Now, I, I really I don't want to wait any longer. Uh, I, I would like to introduce our moderator for our industry panel. Uh, I'd say he's overly qualified to be the moderator. He was writer-director on Jurassic World, executive producer and writer on Jurassic World Fall of the Kingdom, and writer-director on Jurassic World 3. So, uh, you guys just got a chance to see everybody watch Jurassic Park. I was sitting with some of you. I was in one of the theaters. Did you, get a, did you see our footage from Fallen Kingdom? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I will tell Jay Bayona, we've been working so hard. He did an incredible job. You guys are going to love this movie. We're so proud of it. Uh, so, we have some awesome surprises tonight. We've had surprises every night. I think you're going to be glad that you came here tonight. Uh, I think you are. Hold on. Uh, I just wanted to do something really quick. When I was uh, young, when I was 16 years old, uh, I snuck out of my house because I was grounded at the time and I went down to a movie theater uh, to watch this new movie that my friend who was a projectionist had to unspool at midnight the night before uh, to make sure that the film print worked. Uh, it was called Jurassic Park and I sat alone in a theater in Oakland, California in the center of the theater and watched this movie all by myself and I never imagined that I would have uh, the honor to be able to be here today, not just being involved in it, but to be with so many people who love it so much. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, Jurassic Park is one of those things that when someone asks you, like, what are you a fan of? Uh, and you say Jurassic Park, I hope you guys have as much pride in that as I do, because I love Jurassic Park. But we have three kids here that saw Jurassic Park for the first time today, and I wanted to bring them out and just ask them what they thought. Are we cool? All right, this is Nick, this is Ashley, and this is Penelope. Nick, talk to us, man. You've never seen that movie before. What did you think? Um, I honestly thought that it was a great movie. And um, I don't know. I had watched the rest of them. The last... Uh... There's some other ones. I've heard yeah, there's some yeah. others. <laughs> it's quite a few. 
Uh, yeah, was it scary as you thought it was going to be to make you jump? Um, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think it would be as scary as it was. Yeah. Um, Right on. Penelope. <laughs> what did you think? What was your favorite part of that movie? My favorite part was when the scientists came out and they discovered that inside the mosquito was the dragon's blood. And then they, made, they recreated the, the dragons, I mean the dinosaurs, and then the dinosaurs came back to life. That was amazing. And you see, so you like you want to be a scientist, is that right? You like the science. That's really cool. That's something that's that's exciting for us because you know something is that there were so many kids that were your age when they saw Jurassic Park, and that's why right now we're finding so many new dinosaur bones because they all became paleontologists and they're out there finding dinosaurs right now, which is an amazing thing for a movie to do. That's awesome. I'm glad you love science. Ashley, what do you think? It was a good movie, a bit scary, but overall it was a really good movie. Yeah. Do you think it's the scariest of all of them? I think it is. Do you, no? no? Which one was the scariest for you? The new one. Oh, well. well. I don't know if I agree, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you guys for coming out. I just wanted everyone to hear from you because we remember what it was like to be you. And it was one of the best experiences. So thank you. All right, uh, the uh, the assistant director on a film uh, is a fascinating role. It's the hard, one of the hardest jobs in the game, uh, and it is the one person who is there for every single moment. So as Steven Spielberg was directing this movie, his assistant director was there for every single shot and saw everything that we all wish that we could have been there to see. Uh, the AD from Jurassic Park, John Kreshmer. So my next guest, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Stan Winston, uh, who is no longer with us, Stan Winston is not here, so he's no longer with us, but uh, his legacy uh, is strong, and John Rosengrant, who's coming up right now, uh, was the man inside the raptor in Jurassic Park. John also worked on Avatar and Iron Man and Terminator, like everything that we love, like he was doing. Um, I don't think my next guest needs any introduction. Jeff Goldblum. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Jeff and I got a chance to work with each other. We did a we did a commercial that was on Super Bowl where you finally had got to see uh, you run driving from a dinosaur. Did you see that during the Super Bowl? Our commercial? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. He directed it. He directed it. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Very brilliant. Very well. Oh yeah. Uh, so look. Guys, you know, what I think, you know, I think that a lot of people here are used, you guys have all seen all the documentaries on the Blu-ray, like I don't think that there's going to be a lot of things that, that you don't know about this, except for things that you've never heard before, because we have the people who were there. So I'm going to start with you, uh, John, you know, I feel like uh, the process of making a film like this, it, you know, it is back-breaking work, but it is also, it is such a, a cathartic joy, you know, from start to finish. Tell us something that no one here who loves Jurassic Park has ever heard that happened on that set. Thank you guys. No um, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell the story I told the other night, which is um, yeah. Stephen is the consummate filmmaker. Stephen Spoke is the consummate filmmaker and loved, loves what he does. And we were shooting the very last shot on the schedule, which is a retake of Lord Richard Attenborough sitting on the counter of the Airstream Taylor trailer raising his champagne glass and toasting uh, Sam and Laura. Oh. Now normally Stephen, and Jeffrey will attest to this, 
Stephen would do maybe seven takes maximum of every shot. And he'd print one and we'd move on. So we do two takes, four takes, seven takes, ten takes, fifteen takes. This is a shot of Richard Attenborough raising his glass. He's not even saying anything. Seventeen takes. Finally, take twenty, I grab Stephen by the arm and I say, Stephen, enough. He says, you don't understand, this is my drug. He wouldn't let go of directing. And you have to remember, in six weeks, he's going to be directing Schindler's List. It's not like he's retiring. So I was, it, it's, it's a testament to what a consummate filmmaker he is. Don't you have something to add? <laughs> you look like you have something to add. I don't. Beautiful story. Beautiful story, John Cranfer. I love that. Well, no, no, no. It's Steven Spielberg, as we all know. Yes. Uh, consummate. Uh, I'm going to get to you in a second. Uh, <laughs> John, uh, you know, I, I think that it, a lot of people are familiar with Stan Rinson's work, but I think because we un sadly are not able to have him here to talk about his work, can you give us an idea of, of just the spirit of working with him? As, as it began, as you were told, you had to build massive 20-foot tall T-Rex to, uh, to stare down these actors. Tell us about it. We well, love you, John! First of all... Huge shout out to Stan Winston, who we all miss. My mentor, I was so fortunate to work with him for 25 years, and he was a great artist, a great human being, and uh, an innovator. And I remember when I first heard about the Jurassic Park, you know, which for me was a, was a big deal, because I grew up loving dinosaurs like probably everyone here, and every little kid in the world. And, you know, S Stephen came to Stan with his challenge because he had seen what we had done with the Queen Alien and Aliens. And he felt like, you know, I think these guys might be able to do this. And Stan, you know, jumped right up, took it on, said, of course we can. Then afterwards, in Stan's typical style, said, I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> but you know, there was no challenge that Stan would back down from, and uh, we were all alone for this amazing, amazing ride. Uh, so when you saw one of those creatures for the first time, and you had been a fly, like you had, you had, you had dealt... <laughs> You had dealt with uh, makeup and, and this kind of you know creature effects before, but when uh, I don't, and I'm actually curious what the first animatronic was that you had to interact with. Was it the T-Rex scene? Uh, was it the Triceratops? What was it? No. Here's what I here's what I remember. Do you know we were there? Uh, and you'll bear me out unless I'm wrong. Unless there was one before this. But I think the first you know we shot in Kauai, Hawaii for the first two weeks. Uh, famously, and there's much to say about that, but I believe the first time I saw a Stan Winston animatronic uh, dinosaur was in the scene with the Triceratops. Yep, 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 yep. The sick, <laughs> sick Triceratops. Sick Triceratops. You remember it, and Jerry Mullen, of course, who was another big producer on that movie, played the veterinarian and then we go up to it. It's where I believe I say that's one big pile of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yes, that is correct. That was the next day. But that's that scene, isn't it? That's kind of that sequence. Is it? And then we came. Well, I, we came upon that thing, and of course, it's not on the back lot of Universal where we shot most of the rest of the movie, but in what is the natural? What looks like, I guess, what's supposed to be Costa Rica, or anyway, it looks very authentic, and. Uh, you'll know better than I do, the puppeteers, or whatever they're called, the master craftspeople, are seven or eight of them, as I remember, were hidden in some kind of bunker <laughs> underneath. Underneath. So the actors, when we went up to that thing, we saw a life-size triceratops, for heaven's sakes, breathing and blinking and doing everything, and it was absolutely breathtaking and st stunning. How about that? It's incredible. Woo! John, I remember when you were, John actually puppeteered our Apatosaurus on Jurassic World, 
Uh, and uh, that was an incredible moment for me. I remember my son coming up and, and the Apatosaurus eating grass out of his hand oh, yeah, that you were puppeteering, which is one of my, my all-time memories as, as a father. Oh, okay. uh, yep. But I remember you mentioned that uh, the, the way that you integrated the Triceratops into the earth, you took the red dirt and you, you spread it all over them. Just, I, I'm really interested in, in what steps you took uh, once you actually got them out of the lab, out of, out of where they were constructed to make them feel real. Well, that, that's a good point because the guys that are building and painting and laboring and putting all this detail into it, and there was a fellow named Joey Orozco who had done this tremendous paint job on it, and then when it gets to Hawaii, <laughs> it's, it just needed something else, and this is what you're talking about. And then red clay dirt starts going all over his paint job, and at first he's horrified. But when you think about it, whenever you see a big animal that moves through the ground or whatever, it, it all of that dust is going to get on it when you, you observe a rhino or an elephant. And so it was that extra bit of detailing that took it to another level that, that really made it kind of sing out and be real. It was one with the earth. I remember, John, you were talking a little bit the other night about uh, the sequence with the T-Rex, and when you first arrived and realized that you were going to be shooting this thing with a camera that felt completely real, what was it like to be there on that on that night? Well, it was, it was the most spectacular puppet probably ever created or ever will be created, because not only was it a life-size T-Rex without legs, it was on a motion uh, platform, motion base, which was used for flight simulation, and the puppet was uh, was animated by uh, guys hold, uh, moving a something called a Waldo, which is a miniaturized version of metal ar metal armatures, which were connected with a computer to this large thing. So they they could move the head very quickly, and you'd see the head of the T Rex go whoop, like that. So it was. I, I think Colin, you pointed out this. It was actually a very dangerous machine. It could actually kill you if you were if you didn't stay away from it because it, it moved just like a live animal. Twelve thousand pounds. Right. And there was no delay from the time they moved the Waldo to the time the T Rex moved. When you see the movie, none of that is sped up. That is actually moving as quickly as it appears when you see the T Rex attack. It's it was the most incredible job of engineering and puppetry I have ever seen and ever will see and you will ever see. Go go ahead, Sergeant. But all of my movements in that first one are sped up in post-production. I could never move as quickly as I was in that first movie. <laughs> well, what, uh, while I have you, uh, what, uh, you know, you read a book that had a character in it, Ian Malcolm. And, uh, you know, you went through a process of deciding how you were going to bring this character to life. And what were some of the things that you thought about before you even stepped on the set with this guy? That's a very interesting question. You know, did, I, did I ever tell you that where, where, I told you that story where... Well, you didn't tell them. <laughs> but I'm sure they've heard it because I've told this story where I had a meeting with Steven Spielberg, uh, you know, in his office some, somewhere close to here. Yeah, and um, I'd read the book, and by the time we had the meeting, he said, you know, there's a new draft of the, of the script uh, where your character is eliminated. <laughs> Your lines are kind of taken up by um, Alan Grant, and I kind of made a pitch, and anyway, I got in the movie. Um, but, but just a little bit, we got the movie. Yeah. Can, can I, I'm sorry, I, I have to mention to you guys something that I've always wanted to tell Jeff for 25 years, which is when you, when you see the scene where they're in the Jeep, and they're just before they get the Triceratops, and he's doing the chaos theory s sequence. And then uh, Sam gets out, and then Laura gets out, and he says, and here I am by myself, and that's chaos. See, I'm proving it. It seems like he's making those lines up. Jeff is the most unique actor I have ever worked with, and I have worked with thousands of actors. He is the only actor I know who you think is making up the words. He makes them his own. And those words are absolutely scripted, but you would never know to watch the film. So thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, John Crash for a while. It's one of the, it's something I'm very envious of as a writer, in that you know we we write these new films, but when you watch Jurassic Park, so much of that dialogue is from Crichton. It's from the book, and on most most of your iconic lines are from Crichton, and uh, or you uh, or David Kemp who wrote that film. Although, film. although it's amazing look at this how pile much. of shit, I think was his line. That was you. Yeah, I think that was you. <laughs> uh, 
about it. But it's like it puts anyone, you know, for us writing these films, it puts us at a great disadvantage to not have Crichton's dialogue in the movies. I think it's it's underestimated like how much of a of a massive help it is to have someone so brilliant contributing uh, to the script. Uh, what were you know as as you stepped into that character, did did, did he help just define it for you? Yeah, yeah, he uh, yeah. I mean, not him. I didn't talk to him, right. but yes, that book, and I kept referring to the book. But I think play, playing that, to answer your question, I think playing that part then as as it was in in our movie, the one you just wrote that I had a little part in, this next movie coming out, I, the, 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 the most provocative things are the questions that are really, that that character addresses. Um, like, in the first movie, and now, and now 25 years later, like, you know, with this power, you know, where does science, you know, what, what, how highly can we esteem science? Science is a very beautiful thing, I think my character is thinking about, and, and that the, the, the uh, mechanism of human curiosity is a wonderful and beautiful thing, and the accomplishments of science, of course, are beautiful, but, um, but the questions of ethical, their ethical use, and politics getting involved, and um, national concerns, and nationalism, and uh, greed, and money, and militarism, of course, uh, is of real passionate interest to my character then and now. Uh, and are important issues in our world. I can I can tell that story. I have a story now because I was in my home. I live in England, and, and my my wife said uh, Jeff Goldblum's on the phone, and I we'd never spoken before. And I had written you know I'd written your scenes, but most of your dialogue was from Crichton in our film. You know I pulled from the book, and then I I'd, I'd done my best to, to kind of fill in the blanks. And he and I sat together on the phone for about an hour. Yeah, uh, hour too, as I remember. I was in my little house. I wasn't going anywhere. Like as long as you wanted to keep talking about you were. So sweet. I'm there. That was very. That was a very memorable. I loved. That was as creative a time as I had on this last movie. Our preparation yeah. and talking about and tweaking and talking about the issues that I'm that we're talking about now and, and how we could best articulate them in that scene. I loved that. It was amazing how so much of what he had written in you know in in Jurassic Park was completely relevant, if not more relevant now, to what's going on in the world and what science has has wrought uh, and the dangers uh, of of it spreading too far. Yes. Well, not the dead, dead. Science in itself is not so dangerous. Yeah, it's genetic power. How we use it. Yeah. Yes. I mean, my character in the movie finally brings up, if it's still in there, um, yes. uh, nuclear. You made the cut. Power. <laughs> nu nu nuclear power. You know, and I say it's. Uh, you know, these are. You know, Einstein. They're people who came up with these things are brilliant and to be credited. But how we make use of this awesome power that we now have to destroy ourselves or to create uh, terrifically and effectively is really a question and, and it's, it, you know, is going to challenge our humanity and our wisdom and our best thinking and how to manage genetic power, for instance, and what to do with it uh, so that the world can work for everybody. Not a few people can get rich or one nation can prevail over another, but so that the world can finally work for everybody. How do we use these things like that? that yeah. Well, you know, I, I, we've we had a good conversation about the the, uh, the hurricane that happened on the set, and I, I think that you know, filmmaking is is one long process of of, of solving problems uh, every day and new challenges that come up. But very rarely do you have to deal uh, with a natural disaster that happens on your watch. Uh, do you have any memory from from that moment? I have uh, three very funny memories. Well, what, what, the first one isn't funny, and it's about Jeff again. Uh, and, and since this is a love fest for Mr. Goldblum, I'll tell you a story that that uh, when we were preparing for the hurricane, and I'll tell that story after this. Um, Jeff was the only actor who came up to me and said, "What can I do to help?" Aww. It's a measure of the man. I don't know if you're making that up. I kind of remember it, didn't I? Everybody was there. They're, everybody's best foot was forward, though. At times of crisis, that the whole company was very... Uh... Okay, now I'm going to tell you guys a story. I've never told anyone, so I'm going to ask you all to raise your right hands and repeat after me. I... State your name. I, Jeff Goldblum. Solemnly swear... Solemnly swear. 
never to tell this story, never to, tell this story. to anyone as long as I live on penalty of never seeing another Star Wars movie. So help me God. Okay. <laughs> We're filming on our second to last day in Hawaii. Uh, in Kauai. And Kathy Kennedy, the executive producer, comes to the set and says, okay, we all have to pack up. There's a hurricane headed right toward us. The eye is going to pass over our hotel. You have to get into the trucks, get back to, to the hotel, and bunker down. So we all load up in two cars, and the crew goes and they load the trucks. And we have a big meeting in, a, in the production office, and every producer is there, every line producer is there, Rick Carter, the brilliant production designer is there. I'm there, Steven's there, Kathy's there, Jerry Mullen is there. And Jerry says, okay, Steven, just don't worry, I've called Warners, they're flying the jet in, we're going to put you on the jet and get you out of here. Now, I know that Warner Brothers is not flying a $26 million jet into the eye of a hurricane, but I don't say anything. <laughs> And so Jerry then turns to Kathy Kennedy and he says, Kathy, I want you on that plane, too. And Kathy says, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to bail on this crew. And I, without thinking, like an idiot, say, you mean like some people we know? Oh. In that next second, I saw my entire future in Hollywood disappear. <laughs> And luckily, the entire room exploded in laughter <laughs> afterward. Um, <clears throat> the other memory I have, and, and, and I'm not ragging on Stephen because I adore him. A memory I have, very, very fond memory I have of Stephen. That night, we were in the hotel basement, and we're hearing the sound of this hurricane pass over us. And it's, it sounds like a freight train driving through your living room. And I see Steven and he's in the corner, he's in the corner with all the kids from the movie and all the kids of crew members. And he's reciting from memory the opening from the Music Man, the Rock Island, look what he talk, what he talk. He does the whole thing, which is like a 10 minute monologue. And he's doing it to entertain these kids and take their minds off the danger of what we were in. And I just want you to think about that next time you see a Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to do something. I, I've been I've been the one who's been moderating. So we have to top that now. Huh? No, you gotta top that. I've been moderating these Q and A's for two nights now, and I feel like people might be getting a little uh, bored with me. So I brought two friends to ask uh, another pair of questions. Uh, the first, if you saw Kong Skull Island, it was directed by this man, Jordan Bell Roberts. <laughs> I got one more. Uh, if you saw Rogue One, Gareth Edwards. You guys both make pe uh, movies people care about. <laughs> I wish I could make a movie that people yeah, show We are like not this. worthy, by the way. Can we just say that first? So I brought these guys because we are three filmmakers who all are, are roughly the same age. You're a little young, but uh, <laughs> I got a but we, all, we definitely all saw Jurassic Park as as kids or, or early teenagers. Uh, and I, I just thought, you know, as fans, as guest fans, you guys might want to ask one of the, one of these guys a question. Jordan, uh, Jeff, yes, sir. There's a shot in that movie. Yes, sir. With your shirt unbuttoned. <laughs> Laying on your side. <laughs> if I had to describe that frame, it would be smolder. <laughs> I'm just curious. Talk to me about when you were shooting that shot. Did you know that was going to be as iconic? What did Steven say to you? Did you know what that frame looked like? How amazing it is? I know. I had no idea. You're so sweet. And I had no idea about that, of course. Nor do I have memory. Wait a minute. John Kretschmer might be able to shed light on this. Because I do not, and I've been asked about that, I don't have any memory of how, I don't think it was in the script that I was shirtless. It must have been... So it was you. It was, it was Jeff. <laughs> the sexiest mathematician he in the world. He knew. I swear, I don't remember a conversation. Did, did I say, hey, Stephen, can I take my chair and I, can I, I, what, what happened? I just, uh, you just did it. <laughs> Be 
cause he's just sexed him, but... <laughs> I promised them surprises. <laughs> that was going to be my question. <laughs> my question was going to be, Jeff, do those buttons still undo? <laughs> Do the buttons, the buttons, do they still undo? No! <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh. Back to the dinosaur! <laughs> <laughs> Where is this Q&A going? Uh, sir, help us out there. A, a serious question, maybe. Yeah. Is, like, we just watched the movie, we're in there watching it, and it hit me like, like it does every single time, that it's an absolute masterpiece. Like, it's frustrating how good that movie is. And I, it was the first one out of the day, you know, Digital Revolution, you know, it was the first real film that was using digital effects to do things you couldn't normally do before. And I think it's arguably, and I'll say it on record, probably the best one that's been done. And why is that? Why, and I, we're, we're probably to blame as much as is it that, the, like, one of the first ever digital effects movies is probably the best. Is there an explanation that you have, having been through it? I, 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 I'm the guy that did all the live, you know, puppet effects. But the CG stuff, I think, was so brilliant with Dennis Buren and his team, because what they wanted to do is, they paid close attention to gravity, they paid close attention to weight. All those things really matter to them. And now I think some, sometimes it gets to be more about spectacle and writing the impossible. It, but they they grounded those effects when they uh, whatever they did supplemented what we did, and we were the touchy feely close up things. And then when you saw them running and doing, you know, for the first time things that we'd never seen dinosaurs do. There was a restraint to how Dennis and his team handled all that, and it, it, it was really important that it be super real, super realism. I think uh, there are two other things I want to mention. One is, is that Dennis was working for Stephen, and George and, George and Stephen, of course, were best friends, so they wanted to do a spectacular job for Stephen. Uh, that was part of it. They wanted to prove that it could be done. <coughs> I want you all to remember something. At the end of the movie, when the T-Rex makes its last appearance and kills the uh, raptors and then knocks the banner down, none of that's in the script. Nope. Stephen came up with that idea a week before we shot it. And Dennis Muren and his team had to wing that whole sequence. It was Nothing was storyboarded, nothing was planned, and it, I think it's a testament to ILM and Dennis and his crew. Uh, as well as the creatures that John helped create uh, that makes that sequence so spectacular. There, there, was, there was an amazing camaraderie on that film. I don't care what department you were. I mean, the actors made all of our puppets and animatronics more believable. And it, it, I, just the, the synergy that went on between everybody. Everyone had a feeling they were doing something super special. And, and I think it's become a, a seminal movie, and uh, for many reasons. I mean, it's a, it's a great film, a landmark for visual effects, and I, I'm certainly proud to have been part of it, for sure. I think, you know, I, 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 I agree to see, you know, when we were working on our film, like, we're, there was a sense of humility, I think, that we all had, not just for the franchise itself, or the legacy of it, but just for dinosaurs, that, that these creatures were actually here, and I think there's, like, this layer of humility that sort of, like, falls over everything, that, you know, even you know, the character actually, you know, actually speak of it, that we have, these animals show us, you know, how new we are, uh, you know, and how, how small we are. And I think we felt that way as filmmakers. I don't know if, if when you were making it, I knew you knew where you were making something special, did you feel as an actor that your character would go on to be one of the most iconic characters in the history of movies? Did no, you know? No, 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 certainly, no, 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 certainly not. Okay. But, 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 you know, I mean, if we, you know, no, certainly <laughs> But we knew the book was, you know, very beautiful, and Steven Spielberg was uh, uniquely masterful. And uh, I, I guess we got wind. You knew better than I do. You guys knew better. I, 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 he didn't want to start Steven Spielberg without knowing that we could do something pioneering. 
in the visual visuals of those things. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we thought there was a G. There was a good chance. I mean, I, I did, you know, but but certainly was surprised at what what happened to it. You never, you, you know, as we know with many movies, you can you can combine elements, brilliant elements, and it's never a guarantee that the whole thing is going to work, be good, or be enjoyed. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, the, one of the reasons that the three of us are even doing what we do uh, is because of you guys and because of this legacy. And so, on behalf of the three of us, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Thank you. Good on, guys. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.